Now I can uh, invite you to take part um, on uh, the talk to have a most uh, positive way to um, relate to climate change. And it will be with documentary filmmaker Fi Ambo. Um, she will show clips from her climate film 7030, which was premiered here at the CPH Doc Film Festival. And Fee will be in discussion with Shanina Scotland, the head of film of Doc Society um, in the UK, to close this day on a positive note to really warm our hearts as, as audiences, filmmakers, storytellers, earth planetarians, we are all to go on. And um, yes, let's go for a most positive story on climate. Hello. Hi. Hi, Hello. everyone. <laughs> Hi, Fee. Hi. Hi, so, Good to oh, see you. Good to see you, too. So great to see you. Um, so, everyone, I'm, I'm Shanida Scotland. I'm the head of film at Doc Society um, as introduction. And Doc Society, as you may have learned already today, is an organisation that has been supporting independent documentary filmmakers and storytellers for over 15 years. Um, documentary filmmakers are essential to how we understand the world around us, the crises of our time, and of course, their solutions. Further to that, our documentary storytellers are crucial in sparking imagination, not just new ways of relating to the world, but more specific to our talk today, imagining a climate safe and just future. At Doc Society, as you will have heard also today, we've recently launched the Climate Story Unit, an initiative to make storytelling part of the climate solution. What does that mean? Well, that means to support and elevate transformative storytelling that helps advance a future that is climate just and biodiverse. We, of course, know that there is no one silver bullet um, story that is going to eradicate climate emergency, but we are building a unit that supports a wave of climate stories around the world that helps to seed visions. So this is why I'm so thrilled to be speaking with Fee today, director of 7030, the phenomenal opening film of this edition of CPH Docs. Fee is an incredible documentary storyteller, director of films as diverse as Family, 2007's Mechanical Love, and 2014's Good Things Wait, which is about biodynamics farming, which of course was filmed in, in Denmark. So, so Fee's film, 7030, is shot over a year and a half. We pick things up, if you like, in the spring, spring and summer of 2019, where in the lead up to the Danish general election, thousands of citizens take to the streets to demand political climate solution, sorry, climate action. The Social Democrats win the election and come into power on a green mandate from supporting parties and from the people. Young people made it a climate election. So, as is said in the film, it is time for campaign promises to be converted into real politics. Democracy must now show itself that it show us that it can work fast enough, that it can keep its promises in an acute climate crisis. Let's start things off by showing clip number one. I dag, I dag øh, begynder vi ikke at stå og fremlægge principper for noget, vi skal forhandle efter sommerferien. I dag der snakker vi om det, vi lige har stået og fremlagt herinde, som er historisk ambitiøst. Skal vi ikke snakke lidt om det, vi foreslår i dag, fordi vi kommer ikke til at diskutere det igen på den anden side af sommeren. Vi har ikke nogen forudsætning for at konstatere. Jo, men, men du, du repræsenterer dem heller ikke. Det er slet ikke det, de siger. De siger ikke, de har en model. Alligevel vildt nok, ikke? Ja, nu punker de os et halvt år. Hvorfor sker der ikke noget? Og så kommer vi med noget, som ud for alle parametre er kæmpestort. 
Og så er det eneste, der de siger, det er, hvad med det ikke kommer? Men altså, I laver en klimalov, som dybest set bare vedtager det, som I hele tiden har sagt, ikke den der 50 reduktion. Det er jo klart, at I gerne vil have lidt indhold, du. Åh jo, åh jo, ej, men altså, seriøst! Mener du ikke, det er helt reelt at sige, fair nok, okay, nu bliver man inde? Jeg skal lige høre, hvordan tror I pressen vil tage imod, fordi jeg har jo egentlig immunitet og sådan noget, så det er ikke så meget det, jeg er nervøs for, men hvis jeg en dag bare lige sådan klapper en journalist ind, Nå, altså, ikke, ikke, nu ser jeg bare et hypotetisk spørgsmål. Jeg skal man sige, sådan lidt grundlæggende frustration over, at når man kommer med meget store, meget vigtige ting, så er det altså proces, og det er, hvornår kommer det næste, der afgør, hvordan det bliver dækket. Det, det, det er bare det, jeg siger. I lørdags, der kom vi med en øh, bred aftale, der sikrer klimatilpasning ude i kommunerne. Jeg har lavet i hvert fald nok fem indslag til din station og til det er om, Hvorfor det var et problem, det ikke var der. Så laver vi det. Jeg har ikke nævnt det. Jeg ikke nævnt det med et ord. Og så har jeg altså også tænkt i forhold til det med Libert. Kan vi ikke snakke med dem på forhånd også om, at, at jeg vil meget gerne stille op, men vi må så godt lige have, at vi bare skal snakke lidt om det, vi har foreslået, og ikke kun det, vi ikke har foreslået. So, Sophie, um, that actually wasn't the clip I expected to show, that we would show, but never mind. We've been introduced to Dan, and Dan, of course, is one of the political players in the film. And I, I guess um, I, I wanted to ask you with, you know, we're at a time where we, in some senses, have a lot of climate-focused storytelling, climate-focused documentaries. You could also say that there is a climate canon, if you like, a lexicon. But it's at a time as well where the movement is asking itself questions, where documentary storytellers are asking themselves questions about who is not shown and the stories that are not told and the stories that get made. So I guess I wanted to start off by asking you why you wanted to make this film right now. Mm. Well, um, when I saw that the the youth were taking the streets, that we had uh, young young people who doesn't even have the right to vote who were actually setting the scene and and they got so much attention that no one had been able to get before not you know the this the science has been saying this for 30 years but still it seemed like no one was listening so when i could i could see that that it was becoming sort of a mainstream um, discussion climate change i thought that now now is the momentum to show this because a lot of times when we in history books read about revolutions or we see films about revolutions it's often just a few people that are getting uh, portrayed just a few usually men who sign the 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 acts at the end of the film and it, that's for me it was just important to show that uh, that's not how transition works and it's not it's not how the climate uh, movement is uh, is growing is actually growing from the citizens and up so uh, and uh, that's also only the way that the the politicians can make laws that get well implemented is if the citizens are ready to to make the change so for me it was important to show that the change uh, in in Denmark and I think probably in most of the world was made by young people and even children so the, the clip you saw it was the climate minister but the but in the film there are two climate activists, Selma de Montgomery, who in the film was 14 years old, and uh, Esther uh, Keldahl, who's uh, uh, in her late 20s in the film too. Absolutely. And in fact, this may be a good point to just quickly show and introduce um, our audience to Selma and Esther. If we could show that clip, please. Hmm. <laughs> Er jeg ikke mere vred? Jeg er skuffet. Jeg er skuffet over jeres, de voksnes generationsmangel på handling. Og jeg er skuffet over mig selv. Jeg er skuffet over mig selv, fordi jeg i alt, alt for lang tid fandt på undskyldninger. Fandt på undskyldninger for jeres mangel på handling. For det var jo mediernes skyld, og regeringens skyld, og samfundets skyld. Det var dem, der ikke informerede jer om klimakrisens alvorlighed. Det var dem, der sørgede for, at de katastrofale konsekvenser af klimakrisen, konsekvenser, vi allerede ser nu, var umulige for jer at forestille sig. For hvis de voksne rent faktisk vidste, hvis hvor mange liv klimakrisen ville tage, så ville de da handle. Vil de ikke? Ansvaret ligger ikke på skuldrene af én generation, 
Og det gør løsningerne heller ikke. Det ligger, ligger på skuldrene af alle. Og det er tid til at vågne op. Er I klar til at tage ansvar? So of course that is um, uh, Selma, um, and of course she's one of the young climate activists who features in the film. And you know you were talking there about it was so important to you to bring the young climate activist perspective in the film. And I was really struck as I was watching the film how much pressure they do actually come to to pass and bear on the mm. the politicians. And, and you just started to introduce us to why that was important for you um but i wanted to, to yeah for you to ex expand on that a little bit mm -hmm. not only do you take it into the, yeah. the sort of seat of power but you also extract and broaden the lens to outside to the young perspective yeah. and the pressure that they are putting on yeah. the heat they're turning on yeah. the uh on the yeah yeah but i think it's so important that we all know that in a democracy we are all part of this society and we can all uh, make a difference. And uh, what the young people have shown us just in front of our eyes is that uh, they could make this whole climate uh, debate become vivid to their families and friends and to the whole society. So it's just, I, I thought it was, it's so important that we all know that we pay, we play an active role in this transition that we're going to go through. Because if, if we feel that it's no use, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm only one little piece in a huge puzzle. We And we can easily get that feeling because the climate change is so overwhelming and the catastrophic images we see and the numbers we see, the graphs we see, you can easily just become depressed and uh, you lose faith that anything can change. And, you know, there is a chance that a lot of things are too late, but we have to fight for our ability to be human and to to work with each other and respect each other and that's that's for me that's also a part of this uh, transition is that we get we become much more aware that we all affect each other and we are all part of a, a democracy so that's that's always also why it was important for me to show that this is a this is a movement that has to seep through from citizens to industry to politicians to to all uh, links of society yeah, and it totally comes through in, in the film. And I think, you know, as as climate storytelling, as we look at the field of documentary, the, the vast field of climate documentaries that are being made at the moment, we really have to look at stories that are positive, that invite people into the conversation, that help audience feel, audiences feel empowered and, and help people like Selma, young people like Selma and Esther, feel as though that they're being heard um, and that their stories are reaching others and that there are those in reaching others, that others are being invited into the, the protests, into the communication, into the activism um, alongside alongside them. And I want to just, just kind of turn the lens lens onto the politicians as well. Obviously, you're at the heart of, of political wrangling. You we see the corridors of power. Why was that also important to you? Well, because uh, a lot of times, at least in Denmark, uh, we get the feeling that the politicians, they, they, they are really, they're trying to trick us. We can't really trust them and maybe they don't know how serious this is. And to be honest, that was the way I felt before I started filming this. I thought that the, they, they're just, um, you know, they're, they're, they're just taking the time to do a lot of other things that are not as important as uh, climate change. So when I started filming, I was kind of, uh, I was really surprised that they, they want this and they are negotiating across political spectres and uh, at the end, they reach a goal that's really ambitious, 70% in 2030 uh, reduction. And that's uh, that, that was just a process that I really wanted to share because um, in, in these stories about politicians and climate change, we have to be really careful that we don't fall into the archetypal way of storytelling, that they are the evil and uh, and they are sort of preventing climate action. Because if we keep telling that story, it's going to 
it, it's going to be so set in stone that it's impossible for us as viewers to um, to work with that stereotype. And it, it simply isn't true. A lot of politicians yeah. are just as uh, scared about climate change as we are, and they are they are working so hard to make these changes. And I just think it's important that we we start to work together with the people who really want this instead of um, all the time putting them down, which is something at least the media in Denmark does a lot. So for me, it was a surprise to see that this is this is actually something that they want and they are ready to collaborate across all kinds of differences. Yeah, and I and I totally and I think it comes through in your film, the vulnerability of Ida and, and Dan and the other politicians who are putting themselves out there as, and actually talking with each other as they try to come up with um, an act that works um, across the board for everyone, but also puts, uh, you know, climate at the heart of, of the story. And I, I, I'm really struck by something you say there about, um, and it brings to mind the idea of sort of narrative tropes, right? And of uh, uh, metaphors, the same language and militaristic language that sometimes we use around climate storytelling, the tropes that sometimes documentary filmmakers and other filmmakers sometimes have to, to work with it. Um, and that because it's good against bad, you know, evil versus, you know, good. And, and sometimes that takes us down an avenue that we may not want to go down or is not necessarily helpful, mm. you know? Yeah, for me, it was, it's been difficult to explain to, you know, to investors and people who, who were in, in the film to, that in this film, um, climate change and time are the it is is what we are we're up against it's not other people i wanted to raise the perspective and say this this is much bigger it's not people against people it's people who are trying to work with uh, against time and climate change and that's sort of that's a whole different narrative but i think that sometimes it's important to sort of to to uh, to look at the broader perspective but a lot of times we just get caught up in these um yeah, in, in the storytelling that we're used to do, we, we're ju we're used to doing this, the good and bad and the evil and, 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 and making this uh, sort of stereotypical uh, storytelling. And, and to me, climate change is just is, too, is way too important for us to fight each other. We need to 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 uh, to get together. And, you know, the best would be if we could see us as humanity instead of nations. But we so that's also why I think it's so important that we start talking about this in another narrative than the war metaphors. Uh, just Janita, like you talked about before, I don't have the language yet. I think we need to develop it together. But it would be great to start that conversation. How do we talk about this so it's not a war zone? Because in a war, we have losers. We have people who get killed and and people are getting killed because of climate change, because it's it's the, these areas that are too hot to live in. But that's it's not fruitful to talk about it like we are at war. We need to talk about this transition in another way so we can work together across nations to to solve this problem that we've created. Totally. And when we use militaristic language or speak about it in the language of war, what's happening is we get used to thinking about things in that way. So we use language like collateral damage or we start thinking about that there is justified collateral damage. That's war language. And it's certainly not how we should be thinking about climate crisis or, or climate change at the moment. I wanted to actually just very quickly show final clip of Ida, who is so important and central to the story. Um, could we show the clip of Ida, please? Men jeg bliver, øh, altså der er jo gået 100 dage, det var egentlig det, at man skal lave forandringerne. Og så tror jeg bare, at jeg blev rigtig ærgerlig over at sidde og kigge på en finanslov, der slet ikke gjorde noget af det, vi aftalte i det der forståelsespapir. Man kan komme rigtig langt med begejstring og visioner og samarbejdsvillighed, men nogle gange skal man også bare være virkelig, virkelig hård. Og så hellere kælling end kylling, mm. som en sagde og for nylig. Øh, og jeg kan godt have det sådan, at... Øh, hvor er de voksne? Altså, sådan kan jeg også godt nogle gange få det. Er der ikke en eller anden min plan et eller andet sted? 
Hej Dan, håber du har nyt efterårsferien. Beder mig rigtig meget til at forhandle klimalov. Er der en plan? <laughs> Ellers så hjælper jeg gerne. <laughs> øh, det er altid godt. Øh, og så en lille smiley her. Tænker, der skal rykkes nu, og at vi også har brug for at snakke lidt mere sammen, så vi går efter nogenlunde de samme resultater. KH Ida, vi to. She she is so um, such a fascinating person, someone who is not analytic in the way that she speaks with young people. I love that vulnerability around um, trying to work out how to communicate with Dan in that moment um, as well. But it it's it's really interesting. I want to pull on a little bit of a thread because of something you said a little bit earlier. Because and it, you know it's present in the film as well that you know the politicians t- such as Ida talk about. Um, wanting to be a guide or show other countries a way. Um, and it feels as though, as you're watching this film, that that was something that was really important to you. You wanted this film to be a guidebook, um, a tool. Uh, of course, all documentaries are tool in, in a sense, but you really yeah. wanted it to be a, a tool, a guide for future visioning yeah. of how politics can act. Do you tell us some yeah. more? Yeah, definitely. You got that right, Janita, because what I thought when I saw this whole climate election that people were gathering and finally we had momentum to do something in Denmark about climate because Denmark are not good at uh, being green, even though we understand ourselves that way. We are not at all. We are we consume things that are polluting other places in the world. So we are, we are really we really need to improve a lot. And it's been it's actually been embarrassing to be a Dane on the climate front for many, many years. So when I saw that now, finally, there's a glimpse of hope that someone is taking this seriously and something is going to happen. And it's going to be sort of a political tool that could be implemented and scaled up in other democracies. I thought now is the time for me to grab my camera and finally do a story about Danish politics, because this is something that I've never even touched. Finally, I saw just this glimpse that we could we could actually share some knowledge that we could actually show that if you work across uh, political parties, you can you can make a framework that we can work from because otherwise we are all the time discussing. So is it is it serious? Is isn't it serious? Or do we need electric cars? Or are they polluting too? Is the battery polluting too much? There was all the time the feeling that we were just hopping on one place. Nothing was happening. So when I could see that they were actually going to work for for a law, I thought this is something that you could copy paste in other countries too. So finally, we maybe have a tool that can be implemented throughout a lot of other democracies. And as a documentary filmmaker, I I had the sense that this is this can be a moment that we need to um, document because uh, it will easily dissolve in our memories of other things and then we don't have this uh this playbook so that that was that was the motivation to do the film actually phenomenal phenomenal and i wanted to in just our last few minutes time has gone so quickly but i wanted to bring it back to the young people to people like esther and and selma um and i wanted to ask about the response to the film their response to the film and and audiences response to the film as as it's been getting out there over the last few days um and if you could invite us into how they've responded well actually what what's been uh, the audience response is more or less the same as my my own when i was uh, filming the film is that they are relieved to see that the politicians can work together i get a lot of uh, people contacting me saying that I, I was so happy to see that they are human beings that they actually that that they're working hard on this uh, on the task um and that was you know that that's something that rarely hits the headlines so at the, i was doubtful that is this something that will talk to people because it's so opposite to what you usually think will make people interested in a story that that I'm sort of I'm I'm only uh, cheering for the green ones. I'm not I, I don't have a dark player uh, that you can sort of fear. The dark the darkness is in climate change. So I was uh, I was relieved to see that the audience actually felt the same kind of movement to see that that there there are some positive things happening. 
Uh, Esther and Selma, they were they were surprised too to see the politicians that way. But at the same time, they feel that they have to they have to stay on the streets and make their demands from the streets because if they become too much uh, friends with the politicians, they could sort of lose their 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 um, their voice in a way. So uh, for them, I just think it it may be uh, made a nuance to how they communicate or to how they see them. I, I'm not sure because. To me, they can they, they they are allowed to do anything in the world they want in any way they want because they are the generations that are going to live uh, their whole lives with climate change. So we also need to watch and see what what do they do and respond to their demands. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for bringing out the vulnerabilities of of young people everywhere, especially Esther and Selma. The vulnerabilities and the humanity of politicians who are working to get climate central to, to the corridors of power as well. I'm afraid we're, we're absolutely out of time. Um, it's been so great um, to think with you and talk with you today, to think about um, climate storytelling, the supreme importance of capturing solutions as well, of imagining futures and empowering voices of activism. Thank you, Fee. Um, and thank you also to our audience for watching Climate Rebellion Day 4 of CPH conference. Um, everyone should absolutely join the spatial chat now. And I believe the link is in the, uh, the chat space. Um, so thank you again. And thank you, Fee. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.